is no better companion than a frizzy wolf. Loyal, vicious, and a taste for battle that'll put any orc to shame. Honestly, one of the most versatile models that you could get for your miniature collection. Uh, one of the biggest ones that I can think of is not only is it great for 40k, but it's an excellent model to have for D&D or Pathfinder. Oftentimes I use these as supplements for um, companion animals or dire wolves, mostly companion animals because they're a larger model. They get the job done for describing location while keeping them distinct from other miniatures. But again, they work great for dire wolves and all kinds of other really cool stuff for D&D and Pathfinder. And not to mention there are some cybernetic wolves that you can get with other packs for Warhammer, which can be great for things like Starfinder. So first and foremost, we want to start off by using a gray base tone for one of the wolves because we're going to be doing this as a black wolf. And then the other four are going to be getting based in Ushapti Bone, which is a khaki color. And that is going to be the basis for our wolves. So to get started here, what we want to do with the black wolf is we want to go ahead and we want to put an initial coat of Nuln oil all over everything. And we may decide to put a second coat on. It's entirely up to you on how dark you want the wolf to be, but the key is to not allow things to pool. It's going to be the same thing with the other wolves as well. We don't want the paint pooling. So the real trick here is going to be to apply the Agrax Earth Shade for the tan wolves. We want to go ahead and we want to put a nice even coat across the entire surface. And with this one, I ended up using three full coats to get nice even coverage across the entire surface. So here you can see me doing uh, the first shade of the Nuln Oil on our Black Wolf. Like I said, I ended up only needing to do about two coats. Uh, I ended up missing a spot between his legs, which I didn't see until I was almost completely done with the video. So please, 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 during this stage, triple check all angles of the model, flip it around, move it around, do whatever you gotta do to make sure that you get even coverage, at least on your first coat. On the second coat, not so much, as the first coat will kind of help to hide your mistakes, but during this stage, it is important to make sure you get every little bit of him covered in some way, shape, or form, as this is what's really going to help to sell the final look. So just keep that in mind when you're doing this stage. So during this stage, we're kind of dealing with uh, aging. And what I mean by aging is choosing the age of our wolves. Darker wolves tend to have a bit more of a visually gray appearance, whether you believe that or not. And um, darker colored pelts tend to be of older animals, or at least in fantasy they are, whereas lighter colored pelts belong to younger animals. So whether you're wanting to put wounds or things on your models, keeping an idea on how old the creatures are, uh, this second stage where we're adding our second wash, that's going to help us to identify their age. So in the case of this model, which is the brightest of all the ones that I did, this only has one layer, that initial layer of wash, whereas the others have two and three layers of wash. The darkest of which has three layers of wash, but the third layer was done after the highlight stage, and that created a huge swell of depth between all of our miniatures when everything was said and done. So also keeping in mind if you're planning to do wounds, whether you've actually cut into the model or not, uh, younger wolves will probably have more fresh wounds, whereas older wolves kind of know what they're doing, so they'll have more scars and less fresh wounds. So keep that in mind when you've uh, cut up your models. If you've put lots of fresh cuts on your models and you're planning to do blood effects, um, although old wolves are not, you know, bulletproof, they're going to have less fresh wounds. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're doing your early phases of work here and 
what you're choosing to use for your color scheme. Moving swiftly along to our first layer of highlights, we're starting off with a similar khaki color to what we started base toning with. And then I moved on to mixing a little bit of wraith bone with my khaki color, and that's just to add a bit of depth and volume. Now I didn't hit all my wolves with the same khaki color with the wraith bone added to it, uh, but I did at least get that front mane and their flanks. You can see that sculpted detail in their flank at the very minimum needs to get some kind of edge highlighting. So whether you choose to do all of this by hand or whether you choose to do this with dry brushing like I am, then that's the way you want to go forward. Now for their midsection with that sculpted detail, it is very low and as you can see I'm kind of working my way almost in a circular motion when working on their midsection. And what that's doing is it's creating a lot of forward to back motion in the brush so any marks that are left through this uh, dry brushing stage is basically creating a fur texture that would go in the natural direction that their fur would go. Whereas if I were to dry brush up and down from their spine to their belly, you would end up with a lot of vertical stripes, which is maybe what you want for patterns, but not necessarily what you want for fur tones. So it's important that when dry brushing, we keep this in mind so that all of these striations go in the same direction to help give and sell the illusion that this is fur and not just a plastic model. Now, whether or not you realized it, I chose not to dry brush the legs as I wanted to have a bit more control over that. So we're going to go back in with the khaki color. You could choose to add a little bit more of a cream tone to it by mixing in something like a wraith bone. But we're basically going to go back in and I want to, similar to how you would do muscles on a miniature uh, or sculpted muscles on a miniature, I want to go in and I want to leave a little bit of that Agrax Earth Shade in along the sculpted muscles in the legs. And what would essentially be like the dog's Achilles heel or its shin, we're going to be covering that back up with a bit of a khaki color and we're going to be basically smoothing out the surface. We also want to leave a little bit of that Agrax Earth Shade in between all of its toes. And I know it's a bit of a bad angle for the way that I've chosen to paint this. I'm still getting used to the camera, so I apologize for the bad camera work. But basically, as you will see as I go forward, that's what's going on here. That's what I'm doing. And if you have any questions more about this stage, feel free to leave them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to explain what's really going on here. I ended up using Scavenge Blight Dinge when I was uh, altering the Black Wolf and basically the same way that I did the legs with the other miniatures, I just used Scavenge Blight Dinge. And that's what you can see here. Now, if you're not quite happy with how smooth of a transition you managed to get between that original wash stage and your highlighting stage, regardless of whether it's a Black Wolf or a Tan Wolf or whatever color you've chosen, you can use a lightly watered down version of that original wash to kind of help blend the colors back in together. And there's a few spots where I'm not quite happy with these wolves, especially in some of the paws where it's more of a hard line than what I would like. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be mixing about two parts water to one part wash, and I'm just going to really lightly coat the surface. I'm not heavily coating everything like I would normally do with a wash. I'm just putting down almost a glaze-like uh, layer for this wash, and I'm just kind of blending those colors back in, and I'm adding just a little bit of depth back into the arms. But honestly, this is a stage that could be completely skipped. 
This was just something that I chose to do because this is something that I like to do as a finishing stage right after the highlights. Now at this stage you can go ahead and you can go in and use a uh, black and you can put in the pads of the feet as well as you can do the nose. I just chose to use solid black. I've seen people add a little bit of green. I've seen people add a little bit of blue. Honestly, it's up to you. Uh, depending upon the sculpt of the wolf and what brand you have, the pads of the feet can be a little bit more pronounced than others, but you do want to try to at least dot each toe and put the main pad of the foot on. Now, there is a trick going on here with the mouth, and we'll cover that in just a second, but I just wanted to go ahead and knock this one out so that you guys knew what was going on here. Typically most dogs, uh, especially dogs closer related to wolves such as German Shepherds, the lips of their mouth is actually a much darker black. So I put a nice little sharp rim of black around the edge of the mouth. This not only helps to define the border between the mouth and the rest of the paint job, but it also adds a good jumping off point for working on the inside of the mouth. So I like to do this stage first, so that way if you get a little bit messy, a little bit sloppy, it's easy to clean up. The only thing you want to be careful about is not getting any black directly on the teeth. As with us putting white on top of black, we all know that's very difficult. We don't need to make this paint job any harder than it needs to be. Now I used Monster Mod to do the inside of the mouth. Um, it's also known as the Breast Cancer Awareness Pink from Reaper Miniatures. And it does a really good job at basically replicating gums, especially if you put a little bit of a red wash on top of it. I then used Wraith Bone because it's a nice off-white and I wanted the teeth to have a little bit of color as though they've got some age. I'm not a really big huge fan of using pure white teeth unless they're on a character like something like an elf or something, simply because I feel like elves would probably have the best dental hygiene if we're honest. But with animals, definitely you want to use something like an off-white, not quite necessarily a khaki, but the nice cream color that we get with Wraith Bone is definitely where I go for most of my animals. Personally, I'm a big fan of just putting a single dot of white as the eyeball for most miniatures, regardless of what it is. And basically, as you can see, I'm pretty aggressive with the way I hold this model. Uh, my hands do shake quite a lot, and I need that dot in the eye to be pretty close to a perfectly round circle. It's okay if it's a little on the oval side, uh, but if it's a lot on the oval side, it's pretty obvious. So you want to do your best to get that dot right almost in the middle. And the trick to getting eyes to look realistic is not necessarily that they're both perfectly looking straight forward, but you want to have one just slightly more to the center than what the other one is, because your eyes naturally have a dominant and less dominant eye, and as a result of that, one eye is constantly slightly tipped in, and that's going to give you a much more realistic look. Animals are the same way, and if you just have both eyes staring straight out in front of the creature, uh, they tend to look a bit derpy, if we're honest. So we've moved over to the workbench here. Now, I notice a lot of people like to base after they've painted the miniature, so I wanted to do a video about that. A lot of times I try to do the basing before I paint the miniature, as I feel it helps to give me a better idea of what the model's gonna look like when it's done. Uh, but a really good option for adding you know, debris and rocks and things after the fact is tree bark. And if you just use a long bladed knife like that, like a box cutter, you can just slip it into the tree bark and kind of work it back and forth until you eventually work all the way through or just snap it off. And this works really great once you've painted it all up to look like rocks and things and you can glue it in at all kinds of weird angles for basalt and you can use it for all kinds of just really cool effects. You can even make it look like slate in really small pieces. And as you can see going forward, uh, this is really going to add a huge amount of depth to the miniature. The trick though here is, especially if you're going to be using these for Warhammer, is you don't want the basing material to overhang the base by a huge margin as you need base-to-base -base contact a lot of times according to most rules for most games. So you want to try to keep as much of this on the base as possible, unless you're going to be using this for something like D&D, in which case, get creative. So 
So we jump forward a little bit here and basically I used a mixture of sand and baking soda because sand tends to be a slightly larger grit and at this scale that would look like small pebbles and things and the baking soda works really well for sand or dirt texture at this scale. So we've applied that across the base with a little bit of PVA. I let that dry overnight and then basically we're going to be using a brown and almost applying it in a wash like fashion so that it soaks into all of this grit to make this look like dirt. And then we're going to use scavenge blade dinge as our first layer on all of the quote unquote rocks, which is the tree bark. Now the trick to the tree bark is you want to apply a little bit of super glue along the edges, extra thin if you have it. And what this is going to do is it's going to help to make sure that that tree bark never really breaks up and that it sticks to the base good. Uh, now understand that wood does soak up paint, so you may need to use two to three coats of the scavenge blade dinge to properly coat all of the tree bark before we move on to the next stage. One of the next stages I did is I came in with a little bit of super watered down Dawnstone and I basically speckled applied it in about three rough coats and what that's going to do is it's going to add a bit of depth and variation in the color of the stone work that we're doing here so it's not just Skaven Blight Dinge. You could also use some other washes on top of this before we go on to the dry brush stage uh, such as Seraphim Sepia or Acrax Earthshade if you wish but in the end I don't feel it was necessary. One of the final stages that we do here before we start moving on to adding all of the texture stuff like the snow effect that I plan to add to this as well as any basing tufts is I want to go ahead and do a mild dry brushing of this uh, XV88 color. This is almost like a very light weathered leather brown color and I want to do this as a rough dry brush across the surface as I want to bring a bit of these khaki tones into the base to help tie the whole model together. Now, my understanding is that I'm going to be using these models in a fantasy setting, so it doesn't necessarily have to reflect real life. If you want these to be a much more realistic uh, set of models, you may want to add an Agrax Earth Shade Wash after the stage just to kind of knock everything back down and bring more browns back into the earth tones. One of the last steps in making this tree bark go from tree bark to an actual stone look is the final dry brushing stage. Now you have a few options. You could use a bit of a khaki color with the original Dawnstone that we used to stipple. You could use this Dawnstone on its own or you can add in a little bit of white to it. Now I ended up using a slight mix of the khaki color, the Dawnstone, and the white. But that's just because it's a personal preference. And I ended up doing a final very very light dry brush of white focusing most of the white along the outside edges of the stonework as you'll see in the final version of the miniature. Here you can see me sticking down a few uh, grass tufts from a uh, army painter. I use a few different brands, uh, but in any case where the super glue splashes over just a little bit, you'll see me sprinkle a little bit of snow effect in there to just kind of soak up some of that and bring a little bit more detail in. We're getting ready to add some more snow effect and this will help to sell the illusion that everything is all tied together. So you can always soak up a little bit of a mistake with your next basing option. So in the case of if you weren't planning to do a snow base, you could add just a little bit of static grass or a little bit of foam flock to look like moss, and that would solve all of your problems. Moving right along, we're using Woodland Scenic Snow Effect, and I'm adding quite a generous portion of PVA glue. Now, PVA glue does dry clear, and some people say that the snow effect will tend to yellow with time, so something I do to counteract that is I add just a few drops of this cheap acrylic white ink, and that tends to stop that from happening. Now once this is all dry there may be a few spots where you decide things are a little too thin. Just apply a small amount of PVA glue and then reapply some fresh snow effect uh, without doing this mixture. Just add it in raw. And we want 
about this consistency or a little bit runnier. You'll see here in a minute I end up adding a bit more glue just to make it a little easier to spread with a paintbrush. But we're basically almost like the way that you would apply a small amount of wall spackle. Just use your finger, use a Q-tip, whatever it is, and just kind of mush it into the dirt texture. For my case, I'm not putting huge globs on as I don't want this to be the middle of winter. I want this to either be just the start of winter or perhaps even a springtime where it's just beginning to thaw and there's still a little bit of snow left on the ground. On some of my other social medias, I get asked how often does it take me to make a video? Like, how long does it take to make, honestly? But um, the answer is it's different for different models. Uh, I know that for two packs of these wolves, if I wasn't recording, I could do two packs in about 40 minutes, and that's including the time it takes for the paint to dry. For this particular video, I had about an hour and a half's worth of footage, which has now been cut down into roughly about 22 minutes. So hopefully that answers your question, but honestly, depending upon the model, the answer is really going to be different, as well as the varying degrees of paint jobs. There's a lot more complicated paint jobs that I can do, and we're definitely going to cover those in future videos that are, well, on their way. If you guys would like to support me in any way other than just watching, I am putting together a link tree which has an Amazon wish list for ways that you can help support this channel, whether it be to help me buy camera equipment or models to make future videos with, as well as a Patreon, which I admit I don't really know what I'm doing with Patreon yet, but we'll figure it out together. If you want to give a one-time donation, a link to my PayPal is in there as well, as well as a few other ways that you can help support me by following me on other social medias. So I hope this has been informative and I hope you guys have liked this video. As always, I hope that your pile of shame never runs out and I hope your display case is always overflowing. I'll see you guys around next time. Thank you so much for watching.